Imagine you were a paleontologist and you discovered fossils of a new, never before seen species of organism. What would you know about it? How would you determine how and where it lived? What could you actually say about it? New species originate on our planet through evolution. Evolution is arguably one of the most complex and nuanced topics in historical geology, and perhaps in science as a whole. But let's review some general ideas. There are many levels of organization on our planet. The highest level is the biosphere, which consists of all life on Earth. The smallest level is made up of individual organisms. The basic unit of evolution are populations. A population is all of the individuals of a group or species who live in a specific location and are capable of reproducing with one another. In general, evolution is any change in the characteristics of a population from one generation to the next. These characteristics are determined by the DNA in the cells of the individuals of the population. The DNA is the genetic material that is passed from one generation of the population to the next. It contains the instructions for the development, functioning, growth, and reproduction of individuals in the population. Over generations, Populations evolve, and the observable characteristics and genetic material change. Scientists distinguish between two levels of evolution. The lower of these levels is called microevolution. Microevolution is evolution within species. It includes all of the changes in the observable characteristics and genetic material of a population of a species from one generation to the next. Inherently, there is variation in all species. Humans, of course, are no exception. We vary in eye color, hair color, skin color, height, weight. Hell, some people can roll their tongues while others cannot. In microevolution, the frequencies of certain characteristics change over time. Some characteristics become more common over time. Others become more rare or they disappear entirely. The higher level of evolution is called macroevolution. Macroevolution is evolution among and between species. It is the sum of many microevolutionary changes over geologic time that leads to the evolution of new species, genera, families, orders, and other taxa. Macroevolution deals with the origin of new types of life on our planet and accounts for all of the major evolutionary changes that have occurred on Earth over the last four billion years or so. Macroevolution occurs when microevolution leads to speciation or the origin of new species. In this sense, macroevolution is the sum product of microevolution. So, how and why do populations change over time? Overall, there are six main causes of microevolution. Mutations, genetic drift, gene flow, natural selection, sexual selection, and artificial selection. Mutations are random alterations of genetic material caused by damage to DNA or errors in replicating DNA. Contrary to some misconceptions, mutations are common and natural 
and they very rarely result in observable changes in the characteristics of organisms. That said, mutations create the variation among individuals, and over time, it is possible that a mutation may become common in a population over multiple generations if it is passed between parents and offspring. Gene flow is evolutionary change in populations caused by the migration of individuals and the interbreeding of individuals from different populations. If an individual moves from one population to another, it may introduce its genetic material into that new population and cause it to evolve. Genetic drift refers to changes in populations caused by chance events. For example, if a certain percentage of individuals were randomly selected and removed from a population, the population may afterward have a very different set of physical characteristics simply by chance. Genetic drift may be caused by some sort of bottleneck event. During a bottleneck event, the size of a population is suddenly and randomly reduced, and the frequencies of characteristics in that new population have quite different frequencies from those in the original population. These bottleneck events can be caused by natural disasters like volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and even asteroid impacts. A catastrophe that kills off many but not all individuals of a population can cause a bottleneck effect. This phenomenon suggests that catastrophes may have driven the evolution of life on Earth by randomly reducing population sizes and causing bottleneck effects. Genetic drift may also be caused by founder effects. Founder effects are created when new populations are created or founded by small groups of individuals, which may not accurately represent the diversity of their original ancestral population. The ancestral population may change because it has lost individuals, and the new population may differ from it because it was founded by a non-representative group. Although mutations, gene flow, and genetic drift play key roles in microevolution, the main driver of evolutionary change is natural selection. The theory of evolution by means of natural selection was independently conceived by two English naturalists. Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. They first presented their theory to the world in 1858. Today, Charles Darwin gets most of the credit because his 1859 book entitled On the Origin of Species provided the bulk of the evidence in support of his theory of natural selection. Importantly, this work argued for the common ancestry of all life, establishing the concept that organisms evolve and change over time as new species originate from modification of old ones. Natural selection relies on four concepts. First, each species produces more individuals than can survive to maturity. Resources are limited, and some individuals do not survive long enough to produce offspring. Second, there is natural variation and diversity within populations. Again, think back to humans. There is a lot of diversity in the appearance and genetic material of humanity. Third, some individuals in populations survive longer and reproduce more than others do. We call this survival of the fittest 
There is competition among individuals for food, living space, water, and even mates. In this contest, some organisms will succeed and even thrive, while others will struggle and fail. The organisms that succeed, we say, are adapted to their environments. They have adaptations that help them to be successful in their environment. Adaptations are characteristics that help enhance one's resilience or makes them better suited to certain conditions. There are many examples of adaptation. Penguins, for example, have black backs and white stomachs. We refer to this adaptation as countershading. It helps protect penguins from predators like sharks while they swim. When seen from above, the penguin's black back blends into the dark ocean water below. When seen from beneath, the penguin's white stomach blends into the light of the sun shining down from above. Countershading is essentially a form of camouflage. The final concept in natural selection is that individuals pass on their adaptations to their children. And these adaptations become common in the population because they give individuals the greatest opportunity to survive and reproduce. Over many generations, microevolution occurs because the most advantageous traits, the best adaptations, become more common in the population. Sexual selection and artificial selection are similar to natural selection. In sexual selection, microevolution occurs because some individuals in a population are more successful at attracting mates and therefore more successful at producing offspring than other individuals. In these cases, individuals of one sex are attracted to a specific characteristic in the other. Peafowls are a classic example of sexual selection. The females, or peahens, are particularly attracted to the males, or peacocks, with the most eyes on their tail feathers. The more eyes, the better. This sexual selection has led to the evolution of elaborate tail feathers in peacocks. Because the peacocks with the most eyes in their tail feathers attract the most mates and produce the most offspring, they have passed on this physical characteristic to each new generation. And along the way, peacocks have evolved increasingly elaborate tail feathers over time. Artificial selection is somewhat similar, but it is more closely related to the process of domestication. In artificial selection, humans selectively breed organisms in order to produce offspring with specific sets of characters. This is how humans domesticated and produced fancy pigeons. By carefully breeding various types of rock pigeons over many generations, humans have created over 500 different breeds of fancy pigeon. Each breed has its own distinctive characteristics. All of these birds are descended from one common ancestor, the ancestor of all rock pigeons that lived hundreds or thousands of years ago. Given time, natural selection and other types of microevolution lead to macroevolution and speciation, or the origin of new species. Speciation can occur under a variety of conditions, but the most common mode of speciation, perhaps, is allopatric speciation. 
In allopatric speciation, a new species is produced when a single population splits in two, and the new populations continue to evolve in isolation until they are no longer the same species. Allopatric speciation often occurs when new populations are established on islands. Populations living on different islands may evolve different characteristics and ultimately become different species, particularly if there are any founder effects associated with genetic drift. It is important to recognize that these processes, allopatric speciation, natural selection, gene flow, genetic drift, and mutation, have existed on Earth and have been affecting the evolution of organisms to some extent since the origin of life between 3.5 and 4 billion years ago. Evolution falls under the umbrella of uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the concept that all of the processes that apply to the world today have always operated on Earth. Life on our planet is now and has always been influenced by evolution. This is an important concept because it means if we find a fossil, we can infer how it evolved and how it lived. Taxonomic uniformitarianism is the assumption that a fossil species inhabits the same environment and lives in the same way as its closest living relatives. Consider these major groups of animals in the fossil record. Today, corals, brachiopods, and echinoderms only live in the ocean. There are no freshwater species in any of these groups. Recognizing this, taxonomic uniformitarianism tells us that all fossils of corals, brachiopods, and echinoderms were produced by organisms that lived in the ocean. A related concept is called morphological uniformitarianism. It is the idea that the morphology of a fossilized organism can tell you about how and where it lived. It would have lived in an environment where you can find organisms with similar morphology today. As an example, leaves come in a variety of shapes and sizes. These shapes and sizes are related to the environments in which the plants live. Plants that live in warm climates tend to have leaves with entire rounded margins. Conversely, plants that live in cooler climates often have leaves with serrated, jagged, and toothed edges. It stands to reason then if you found a bunch of fossils of leaves, you could probably determine what sort of environment and climate those ancient plants inhabited. You would simply need to conduct a leaf margin analysis and determine how many leaves and how many plants had smooth edges or jagged edges. As is often the case, Understanding how our planet works today is the key to the past.